audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Welcome to On The Rock, God's unchanging word for changing times with Dr. Camille Majdali, Director of Teach All Nations Melbourne, Australia. Dr. Camille lived and studied in the Middle East, served as a principal of a leading Bible college and now travels the world teaching God's word. He has an extraordinary knowledge of the Bible and a dynamic ability to make God's truth come alive in a real, practical way. This episode of On The Rock will give you keys to survive and succeed in the days ahead by hearing and doing the words of Jesus. It is a sad fact of life in a fallen world that when somebody is becoming successful, then there will be those forces that will try to drag them down. Call it tall poppy or just downright bold-faced envy. It is part of our wretched human condition, one of the reasons Christ came to this world to redeem us from. And yes, in Jesus' own ministry, he faced furious opposition, opposition that would lead to his arrest, trial, condemnation, and execution. And so, as we begin Matthew chapter 12, we will entitle the whole chapter, Growing Opposition. As Jesus becomes more popular, the opposition gets bigger and more ferocious. And, of course, one of the things the opposition will try to do is to trip Jesus up, make him in a situation where a mistake will happen, and then they have a reason to accuse him. And it will have to do with their attitude towards the Sabbath day. Now, remember, out of the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath is number four that you are to keep the Sabbath, or at least Israel is to keep the Sabbath day as a memorial of creation. Not that God was tired, but he did stop creating on the seventh day because it was finished and it was good. Just as Saturday Sabbath is a memorial of creation, so the Lord's Day, Sunday, is a memorial of the new creation that we are in Christ. Although we believe every day belongs to the Lord and that we're not particularly bound by any one day, we can learn about this as we go along. We do need a Sabbath's rest. We do need to have time off. We need to get away from the normal routine and spend it in worship and time with family and relaxing. That's all very, very good and wonderful. But when the Sabbath becomes more of a burden than a blessing, then there's something curiously wrong. And that's what's happening here. So let me read to you a couple of verses here from our range of verses teaching about the Sabbath from Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. And I'm going to read to you now from verses 7 and 8. And Jesus is speaking here. It's all in red letters. He says, But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Can I just say, this really summarizes it all. Jesus Christ, Son of David, Son of God, Messiah, soon coming King, He is Lord of all, and that includes the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not the boss. Jesus is the boss. But what we're going to see is that the boss is going to have to shine his light upon some very, very dark hearts, and they won't like it one little bit. Remember that what we're going to see is it's lunchtime. They're walking through the grain field. They take Jesus and his followers, some of the heads of grain, and pop it in their mouth because, well, it is lunchtime. And yet they are accused of breaking the Sabbath. And Jesus then counters it with an incident in the Old Testament regarding David and his mighty men visiting the priest at Nob, Ahimelech. And they didn't just take heads of grain off the stalk. They actually took the sacred showbread. And David and his men ate the sacred showbread. And yet they were blameless. The priests were blameless. And remember, the priests constantly violate the Sabbath by offering sacrifices. And yet, they are blameless too. All of this is leading to a particular point. God is the author of the Sabbath. He wants his people to find rest. And ultimately, that rest isn't in a day. The rest is in a person. Because when we 
come to Christ, we rest from our own labors, and we're now dependent on His, His work that He did on the cross. This is the rest that Hebrews speaks about. And so, as Lord of the Sabbath, that means what He teaches and illustrates is more important than what the traditions of men tell us about this sacred day. Nevertheless, because Jesus went against the traditions of the elders, he would face terrible, increasing opposition. All right, now we're going to read the entire segment from Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. The lesson is called Teaching About the Sabbath, and again the reference is Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. Let's listen carefully to the word of the Lord. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were unhungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was a hungred, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would have not condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. Our reading is from Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 9, and our lesson is called Teaching About the Sabbath. Chapter 12 as a whole is about the growing opposition to the ministry of Jesus. Well, first of all, friends, let's recognize it was lunchtime. Now, lunchtime should be a special time, and it is because we're not working our normal work, but instead we are having lunch. As Jesus' popularity grew, so did his opposition. Now, you would think that the Pharisees and other Jewish leaders would have been overjoyed to have the long-promised Messiah in their midst. But when you're eyes are blinded and your hearts are hardened, you could have the dead rising right under your nose and you wouldn't know it. You'd be spiritually clueless. Yet, there were far greater opponents to Jesus, these guys, than the work-a-day sinner, like publicans and harlots, or even the heathen Roman occupation. Now, how can this be? Perhaps the single biggest reason that the religious elite were against Jesus, is in a four-letter word called envy. Envy will blind you, harden you, calcify you, anger you, motivate you in an evil, evil way. And when it goes forth, you will do all kinds of irrational and even ungodly things to spite the person who you resent. Envy really was the reason. Jesus had the following, the authority, and the results that the religious elite did not. So they looked for excuses to accuse him on some of the most minor of issues. Also, the best day of the week to find such excuses against Christ was on the Sabbath, where they had a myriad of traditions, nothing to do with the will of God or leading of the Holy Spirit. It's just man-made traditions dressed up as if they were divine decree. And the Sabbath day was, of course, where Jewish people gathered together in synagogue throughout the country and, indeed, throughout the diaspora. Here, Jesus and the disciples were gathered together, first of all, walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath because, well, the disciples were hungry, and they were plucking the ears, or shall we say, not ears of corn, it wasn't maize, I believe it was wheat, plucking the grains of wheat off the stalk and eating them. Now, that hardly seems like backbreaking work, violating the Sabbath, and in fact, it has always been a practice in ancient and even modern Israel that if a traveler is walking through a harvest field, they're allowed to help themselves to the fruit of the field just to meet their immediate need. 
So if it's lunchtime and you're going through the banana field, yes, you can help yourself to a couple bananas. That's no problem. Just don't take a knapsack and load up with all those bananas. Only for your immediate need. So how on earth can such a practice be considered a violation of the Sabbath? But, you know, religious spirits are adept at creating all kinds of man-made rules and then using them or weaponizing them to punish good, decent people. So what happens? In verse 2 of Matthew 12, the Pharisees saw this, and now they had an excuse to accuse Jesus. They said that his disciples by plucking the grain and eating it, were violating the Sabbath day. Do you know that they have what is called Sabbath elevators in Israel? Just as an example. And a Sabbath elevator in a hotel basically stops on every floor. And the reason for this is so that you don't push the button to the floor you want to go to, because apparently even pushing the button could be interpreted as work and hence violating the Sabbath. It's quaint, and I've never seen anyone get berated for pushing a button, but, you know, it's possible. However, in this case, these people weren't just so much worrying about Sabbath orthodoxy. They were trying to trip Jesus so they could destroy him. What does Jesus do? In Matthew 12, verse 3, he responds immediately, wisely, and in a manner that will basically silence his critics. He took their attention to what David did when he and his men were hungry. The reference to this actual event is in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 to 6. So in 1 Samuel chapter 21, 1 to 6, you've got David and his men basically running from Saul, and they were hungry. I mean, really hungry. And so David goes to a place called Nob, N-O-B, and he meets with the priest called Ahimelech. And he says, look, Ahimelech, we're starving. Do you have any food? And all that Ahimelech had was the showbread that was put before the house of the Lord, the altar of the Lord, in the tabernacle. And so Ahimelech was initially reluctant to give the showbread, but eventually he, he did. He gave it. Tragically, his acquiescence to David's request would result in the death of 85 men who wore the linen ephod and the destruction of the village of Nob. Now, who did this? This was Doeg the Edomite, who reported to Saul, and Saul, who himself had demonic issues, ordered the death of the priests. I mean, what a horrible, tragic waste of life. And therefore, the whole village of Nob was destroyed. Even the women and children were not spared. You can read this in the next chapter, 1 Samuel 22, 18 to 19. It says in verse 4 of Matthew 12 that David entered into the house of God, which is either, we call it the tabernacle or the tent of meeting there in Nob. If I'm not mistaken, Nob could be on the wilderness or eastern side of the Mount of Olives, more towards the north. And there his men ate the sacred showbread, which was only meant for the priests. Now, the showbread represents Christ. First, his sacrifice in the presence of God and then becoming spiritual food to those who come to him. So he is the bread of life, and David was partaking therein. Jesus goes on to say that the priests profane the Sabbath and are blameless. Now, they are obliged to offer sacrifices on a daily basis, according to Exodus 29, 38. And that even includes the Sabbath day, Numbers 28, 9. Slaying and cleansing a sacrifice is common behavior, and understandably, it's work, and it's even messy work. It is this mixing of the common with the sacred where we get the concept of profaning. So priests profane the Sabbath by their sacrifices and offerings, but they are not condemned. Jesus goes on to say in Matthew twelve six that there's someone here greater than the temple. Now, for the Jewish people, they revered nothing more than the temple of God in Jerusalem. The only exception is that they revered the God worshipped in the temple. However, what happens is that by saying he was greater than the temple, Christ affirmed that he was the Son of God. This is made even more emphatic by a statement in verse 8, which we're about to have. But then he goes on to tell us this, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. The Pharisees were guilty of condemning 
the guiltless. There are instances where suspending the law of Moses is the right and proper thing to do. First of all, God himself is sovereign enough to give exemptions to his law. It's not that God is in the habit of contradicting himself. He's not. But he is God, and he can override the law if the need is there. Second, mercy and love demands a temporary suspension of law. For example, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, we learn in Matthew 5, verse 7. So mercy and love must prevail even over the letter of the law. A third thing is that the law that is superior to another, because there are, you know, there is the law of Moses and then there is the law of Christ. Obviously, the law of Christ is higher. And then you can suspend the law, fourthly, out of absolute necessity. Remember that the law is not God. God is God, and the law points to him. The law also shows us God's wonderful high standard, but also condemns us because in our own effort, we fall very, very short. So then, Matthew 12, verse 8, the above exemptions apply to Jesus of Nazareth, because Jesus of Nazareth is, of course, Lord of the Sabbath. He took the initiative for the Sabbath. He's the governor of all things, including the Sabbath. Jesus Christ is our rest, and we will only know true Sabbath rest by putting all our faith and trust in him all of the time. To put the Sabbath above the lordship of Christ and love and mercy of God is wrong. The lordship of Christ, mercy, love, and truth must always, always prevail. After speaking about the true nature of the Sabbath, And putting first things first, we learn in verse 9 of Matthew chapter 12 that Jesus left the critics in the field and he went into their synagogue. Now, with all this in mind, just remember that you will find true rest in Christ and therefore take your rest in Christ, but also make sure to have a day of rest. Also make sure you unwind at night or whenever you actually plan to go to sleep. Because the scripture says God gives his beloved sleep. We don't want to be legalistic. We don't want to be bound to traditions and regulations. But at the same time, we do aim for balanced living. Now, our lesson is called Teaching About the Sabbath. And our lesson for life is when we say that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, that includes the Sabbath, the law, the prophets, apostles, indeed, everything. Remember to visit us at our Facebook page, Teach All Nations Education, and thank you for liking our page. You can also go to our homepage at tantan.org.au and subscribe to the free monthly Issachar Teaching e-letter, bringing future ready advice to your inbox with articles from the Bible, victorious Christian living, and current events in the light of God's Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that Jesus truly is Lord of the Sabbath and Lord of all. We find our rest in him, so help us to find him and the rest he so wonderfully gives. In his glorious name we pray, amen. Today's On The Rock was brought to you by Teach All Nations. If you would like more information about this ministry, to download podcasts, view our online store, attend special events, sign up for our teaching newsletter, make a donation to support this ministry, or to invite Dr. Camille to speak, log on to www.tan.org.au or write to us at Post Office Box 493, Mount Waverley 3149. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.